Okay, guys. Um, welcome to the second class that I will be teaching. And let's wait a bit for you guys to settle down. Okay. Um, good morning. So today we're going to move to the next topic in the software engineering uh, course. Okay. Last time we talked about architecture design, both physical layer, software layer, and also the low level layer, which is code. And today we move from the design phase to the implementation phase, okay? Oh, I forgot that I haven't finished last week's lecture, right? So let's finish the last week's lecture first. Um, yeah. Where did I stop? I think I stopped somewhere around here, okay. so. Let's do a quick run through of the previous weeks, um, remaining part first. Okay, so last week we discussed design, right? So we discussed architectural design, um, physical software, and low level design. And then the last part that I I ended midway is that this human computer interaction design, which is about UI UX and how to design the interface so that the user is happy to use, okay? Uh, we talk about this. Uh, we talk about types of the user interfaces. You have command line, which is the old, oldest version of the UI. You have only text-based visualization of the output, and you only have the keyboard input, right? And then we move to the text menu that you have the menu to select, you can use some mouse and some keyboard, but most of the UI is still consists of text. And the last one, after we have the advancements in graphical user interface and also the computing power, we can have nice graphical uh, UI, like the graph, the picture, video, um, and other types of interact interactive media, okay? And I think I show you this voice control interfaces, right? The Apple voice control that you can control the software based on only your voice. And there are also other types of interfaces like you use your gesture to control the software, such as the one that you have in the virtual reality system, okay? The, the basic rules that all the software application must adhere to is that the software must be attractive. So the first thing is that you, you should design the software in a way that it is beautiful and it is attractive to use. The second one is it is simple to use. It should not be too complex. This is the, this depends on the, the type of the users. You might have novice users so that these people will not know how to operate the software. You, you might have to have, you might need to have the software that is very easy and simple to use. But if the users are the expert ones, like programmers or somebody that are expert in their field, you can have some software that are more complex, like um, Visual Studio Code or the Adobe Photoshop that has a lot of options to, to use, right? The software should be responsive, which means it has speed that is quick and fast, right? Should be clear to understand and it should have consistency across all the interface screens okay i would like to have uh, to propose this design process that can be applied to any user interface design okay so in the basic user interface design process we have four phases the first one is the phase called user task and environment analysis okay so this is a part that we we need to understand who are the users, okay? Um, I need to use my computer today, so I don't use the iPad, right? You need to understand who are the users, uh, where are they working, 
which means the environment that they are in, and what are the tasks that, that they need to do using your software. Phase two is the design of the interface. Or you do the UI design using the tools such as Figma or Adobe XD or so on. And then we move to phase three, that you implement the actual user interface. Uh, you realize it to be the actual UI that the user can interact with. And number four is the interface validation, where we check our design. Check. Oh, quite difficult one. Check. With the users. Check with. Mm. Just slap an iPad in it. Check with the users. Okay, whether they like the, the design or not. No. Okay, this is quite difficult to do. So this is a spiral process because it starts and then it keeps moving to phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and then repeats over time. So you start by understanding the user first, and then you perform the design of the interface. You do the implementation of the interface. And then you give it to the users to check. And after you have checked with the users, you get some feedback from them. You start doing the user understanding again, because now you understand better who are the users and what are they using your software. And then you start readjusting the design and then do the implementation and validation. Okay, so we repeat this process until um, we run out of our resources or we reach the deadline or the user is satisfied with our design, okay? Let's go one by one. So the first phase is user task environmental analysis and modeling. This is when you understand the users. So if you study the concept of, um, what is it called? Um, ideation or, um, the understanding of the users, you, you must start by having empathy, right? Understand who the users are, what are they doing, what are their background, what are their preferences, and so on. And this is that step. You need to understand the skills of the users, what are their knowledge, what are the type of the users. For example, if you, if you give Visual Studio Code to your grandma, he, she wouldn't understand how to use it because that is not matched with the knowledge and the skills that, that your grandma has. But if you have some simpler application, um, let's say many, many parents or grandparents, they still can use live application, right? So um, this is a thing that based on their knowledge and experience, they are able to do. So first you, you must understand who are the users. The second one is, what are the tasks that they need to perform? Are they doing some calculations, mathematical calculations? Are they doing some um, photo editing? Or are they running? There are software that can work while you are on the move as well, right? Like I have my Apple Watch and the Apple Watch has a lot of apps. Some apps work when I'm on the move, like Nike Run is an app that I use when I when I do exercises, right? So these are the tasks that you need to think about. What are they doing? And the last one is the physical work environment. What are the environments that they are in? Are they in the office? Are they out there uh, outside of the office space? Are they in some places that has noises? Are they in some places that has low light conditions? So on and so on, okay? You might ask yourself these kind of questions. Where the interface will be located? The users, are they sitting, standing, or are they doing other tasks that are unrelated to your interface as well? Does it need some hardware to accommodate such space, such light, or such noise? Okay. This will be the one when you need to consider, um, like if your application is based on sound, you might need to think about the noises. If your application is based on light or you have to visually present something accurately, then you might need to consider the, the, the lighting condition as well. And any other special human factors that are driven by the environmental factor or not, okay? 
Let's see these two photos. Let's start with the left one. So the left one, this uh, is the software that I use in some mechanic uh, places or the, the car repair shops, right? The software is located in a computer, but the user, he or she will be standing instead of sitting. And then the location that it is installed is in the in the garage or in the car repair shop. So you might not need to have the user interface that is too complex for the user to use. And he or she needs to also work with the car in order to, to do something, to fix the car, to improve the car, so on and so on. So the software itself, should it complement the task that he or she is doing? So it should be simpler to use and uh, have only the informations that are needed. Compared to the right side, this is the spreadsheet application and the user is an accountant. You can see that he or she is sitting in an office days, having proper monitor and everything. So the application that fits with this type of users can be the application that has complex UI. You can have the spreadsheet and also you have another, another monitor to represent other type of documents, so on and so on. And this has two types of inputs. So he or she has, is that a mouse? I'm not sure. No, it's not a mouse. Where is the mouse? <laughs> the mouse is somewhere. But he or she has keyboards and some other type of control. So you can do some complex mathematical calculations. He or she can type and then he can see the result on the screen. Okay. So by having two different type of users and different tasks and different work environments, you might design your software differently as well. Okay. Uh oh. Oh, okay. So that's the first part. The second part is you start designing the user interface. So when we design, you have many tools that help you, such as um, Figma or Adobe FD, uh, Adobe XD. And these tools help you to, to create the set of interface objects, um, set, set of interface actions. And the other thing might need to be decided by yourself. What is the response time? What kind of UI that would give fast response time? And what, which one that provide a slower response time? Usually something that, that is a list, which has a lot of information, would be slower to, to populate, right? When you have this UI of a list of a lot of photos or images, that will take some time to, to, to properly load the UI. So um, nowadays we have the concept called lazy loading that you show the photo only when it appears on the screen. No, although you have a lot of photos to show. So that, that makes the application like Instagram, Facebook that has a lot of photo work because you don't render everything at the same time. Ah, and what are the other handling method and so on, okay? The next one is we do the implementation of the UI. So using the tool like Figma again or Adobe XD, you can actually create a prototype and then you have that prototype for the next phase, okay? Which is interface validation. So when you have implemented the user interface, you, you test them with the customers and then you see whether they have any feedback that you can accept to be improving in the next phase. Now we have this spiral model, right? So um, there are, there is this one. Let me switch to a browser. I want to show you one example of the user interface. Um, and it is interesting one. Oh, um, I just need to put in the Sound. Oh, oh. Ah, this is 
uh, prototyping of a group uh, of an application called EE. Okay, EE is a mobile carrier in in the UK. I'm not sure whether they have other countries, but in the UK, you have one mobile carrier called EE. And they want to develop a new application and they implement a prototype using paper. So the software that they are building, they build a prototype using paper and they are showing it to the users to see whether the user can use it effectively. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so that's the application. You can see that's the phone. Click loading page. Pass number two, register and login. Login page comes up. Keyboard. Hi. <laughs> okay. You can see that it's pretty simple prototype, but it works, right? It's like very easy to do. Uh, another password. That's correct. Submit. It moves to the next page. Okay. Uh, the task is remove the minute tiles. So there are a lot of uh, elements in the main home page. The task is to remove the minute tile, which is the yellow one. And you can see now that the user is confusing. He doesn't know what to do. Uh, Okay, he finally found it. Ah, okay, and then close. The tie is gone. UI rearrange. Next task is to place top up 10 tiles. Okay, ah, so to add a new tile, it needs to press the plus. Ah, which option do you want to add? 10 tiles. Are you sure? Yes. Back. Ah. And then the new ties appear. Ah, and then rearrange the tile on your home screen. Yeah, okay. Long press until it wiggles and then you rearrange it. Uh, I think you got the idea. So this is paper prototyping. Is this one of the way that you can do user interface validation quickly with, with the users? Okay, just a moment. So this is the, the process that we usually do in the UI design. Okay, you, you understand the users, you you design the interface, you implement it, you give it to the user to use, and then you collect the feedback. The last one is, there are some of the principles in the UI design, which is layout, content awareness, aesthetics, user experience, consistency, and the minimal user effort. So let's see each one of them. So for the content awareness, um, we need to have the least amount of effort on the user part, okay? So we don't want to put too much burden on the students, uh, on the users. So each screen should be uh, presenting only the information that are relevant. And we should have titles on all the interfaces. And there should be menu that show where the user is and how to get there. You now you might have some incorporate terms, right? The one that you have the level of the pages where you are. The second one is about aesthetics. This is how beautiful they are. So you might need to select the color combination that easy to look at, not, not like something like this. So the red text on the blue boxes are not very good. Uh, color combination. And there are 
to to level of design density. If you are the novice user, you might prefer to have lower density design, something like this, that don't have much information to present to the user. Now, so like Apple page, Android page, they have very low density design. While high density design would be some software that you target the expert users, such as IDE for programmers. Now this is intelligent IDE or Visual Studio Code, uh, Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, so on and so on. It is something that when you open the first time, you actually don't know how to use. But when you are proficient in using it, then it can help you with uh, a lot of productivity. Okay, so less content is called low density design. More content is called high density design, okay? And the next thing is we should focus on the ease of use, ease of learning, because they improve the user experience. So some of the software doesn't need to have any tutorial on how to use it. I think software nowadays, they don't have the manual or the tutorial on how to use it now. So how do we make the software to be easy to use? And also they can learn by themselves how to do things in our software, okay? Ah, and the last one is the minimal user effort. And there's a common rule that everything should be done in three clicks, okay? There's a study that Instagram, when it's very uh, beginning, they started the application by having only two or one or two steps. So you can select the photo, you can add a filter, and then you can upload the photo into your account. So they shouldn't be more than three clicks when you want to do something okay, in a software system. Ah, so that is the remaining part of the lecture from last week that I talked about design, right? So we have physical architecture design, we have software architecture design, and we have user interface design, all right? Any questions so far? No? Ah, so next we're gonna move to the content which is actually for today. So today we're gonna talk about the implementation part, okay? And the implementation part, I'm gonna pick the platform that, that are new and becomes quite popular nowadays. It call, it's called low-code programming. For, for the students who have computers with them today, we're gonna do some basic tutorial of low-code programming. So while you listen to my lecture, please download the Mendix app. Um, you Google Mendix, okay? Mendix. Studio Pro download, okay? And then when you go to the marketplace, it should look something like this, okay? If it asks you to create an account, you create an account first, okay? Use your KMUTT email so that you are in the same organization. Okay, and after that, download the version that is the latest version, version 10 15. Okay, it will take some time. The IDE uh, has quite some amount, so it takes some time. So for now, you download the application, and then while we finish uh, my lecture, then we can switch to doing it. Okay, uh, Mendix Studio Pro. Okay. So, so what is the content for today? I I pick this low code platform so to represent the implementation phase in the software development. Okay, we move from the design to implementation, and the the main focus of software engineering is not about writing. Uh, it's not about how to write code because you already learned how to write code for for quite many years now. 
the focus of software engineering is how to develop the software efficiently and with high quality. So I'm not gonna go back and talk about programming languages and how you write the loop, how to write the if statement and so on. But we're gonna use some platforms that help us to develop the software quickly. And then we can try to, to use this to create a prototype for any software system that you want, okay? It is also a good tool for some of the projects. If you want to develop some student projects that needs quick prototyping, you can consider this low-code programming platform as well. So I hope the, the things that we are talking today will be useful for you, okay? Ah, so we're gonna discuss the history of low-code programming, and then I'm gonna show you how to do it in one of the platforms called Mendix. We're gonna discuss some of the basic setup and then we're gonna launch a very basic software application, Hello World, okay? And after this, you have the lab exercise that you will do the whole complete implementation of one single application called training session management, okay? To start, let's discuss what is low-code programming, okay? Low-code programming, is a new paradigm. It is the new development paradigm today that it is based on low amount of coding, but more on the uh, click and select and drag and drop and also uh, configurations, okay? I base my content on this book. You can search the book if you have some online subscription for books, okay? View low code application with many links. So what is low code programming? Local programming based on the concept called visual modeling. So visual modeling is the, the way that we build applications by using what we see. And what we see is what we get. Now, so it's a concept called what you see is what you get with seek. Now, what you see is what you get is a development method that you will see the UI that you are developing and at the end it will become my uh, become your your actual software. So whatever you saw, it will be the actual software that you have. This kind of visual modeling helps you to build application quicker because we can lower the amount of coding. And by having the low code application platform, you can concerns less about the infrastructure, how to, um, uh, let's say infrastructure can include database. We don't need to care about how to configure the database, server, so on and so on. You can still do it, but basic with the basic setup, you don't actually need to do this kind of setup. We're gonna see in our tutorial today that we don't actually need to set up any kind of database. You don't need to care whether it's gonna be MySQL, uh, PostgreSQL or um, SQL Server or so on, okay? And we focus uh, on the creating of the application, okay? So this thing helps speeding up the development process. So to sum up, a low-code platform is uh, we show development environment. It gives you the environment that the developer with various degree of experience, okay? Not everyone can code at the same level. So some of you might be very good at coding, but some of you might not be really like coding, right? There, there are some of my students who don't actually like coding, although they come to study uh, computer science. So it's a bit um, difficult for them. But the local programming platforms allow many people with some degree of uh, understanding to be able to still create applications. So it uses drag and drop um, and then connect the components and then they can create an application, mobile web application easily, okay? So if I want to compare, we have this concept of high code programming, which you write a lot of code. And also this visual programming that you have the UI to show you the look and feel of the same thing. So this is the code that represents this visualization, right? This is written in HTML and CSS, 
and this is the thing that you would see in local programming. You won't, you will not see this code at all, except you want to do some customization. You will focus mostly on building the UI and how to connect them and how to make it work. The tools that we have been using for a long time. So this is Adobe Dreamweaver, which is used for building a web page. Do you know Adobe Dreamweaver? Yeah, you guys know. Okay, it's a pretty old old tool. No, it it was it was around since I was a kid. So this thing helped us to create a web page that what we see is what we get, and there is a HTML and CSS code behind. Okay, Dreamweaver is still available nowadays, but there are a lot more competitors now. So the benefit of low code programming is that. It expands the development capacity, ca capability to many types of users. It's not only restricted to the programmers now. For example, people in the team, in the software development team, there are some roles that are not related to coding, such as business analyst. Do you guys know who is business analyst? We call them BA. So business analysts are the ones that are responsible for talking with the customers, getting the requirements, and convey or discuss it to the development team. It is an important role, and this, these people must have the skill of uh, communicating between technical and non-technical people, and he or she must also understand some certain level of technical uh, background, right? So with the concept of local programming, some business analysts might be able to also create some basic applications or some basic prototypes, and then they can present it to the users. Some business owners that don't have proper education in computer science or computer engineering or IT might still be able to use these kind of local programming platform to build their own uh, application as well, okay? So it expands the horizon of software development to many types, many more type of users, and it helps to develop the software faster. There are many platforms that fall into the category of local programming, such as AppSheet, which is uh, an application based on Google, um, Google Suite. Okay, so if you have Google Sheets, you can write a program on top of your Google Sheet and then you can make some basic application. This is another tool called Mendix. I'm going to use Mendix tool for our tutorial and our lab exercise. Okay, so Mendix is also one of the local platforms. The trend of local programming is growing. There's a Gartner company. Okay, Gartner is the big IT consulting firm, and they are the one that usually creates predictions and trends of the technology worldwide. Ghana says that local programming is gonna be growing 20%. Now that is last year, 2023. But they say that the trend of local programming is increasing. People are creating and learning more and more local programming. So I, I have I have known that some of the companies in Thailand are doing local programming, such as MFEC. You guys know MFEC. Uh, MFEC is one of the big software company in Thailand. And I, I even have my own students who are working as a local programmer at the company as well. And there are other companies that are offering local programming services in Thailand, okay? So, Next, I'm going to talk a little bit more specific about the tool and the platform that we're going to use today. So today we're going to use a platform called Mendix. Okay, Mendix is one of the low-code platforms and it is one of the leaders in low-code development too. It helps you to build the application, test the application and deploy the application. The same company, Garner, they usually release this magic quadrant, which is the, the representation that shows the leader in the market in any specific aspect. 
So this is the net import value for low code programming. And if we look at the 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 the, the, the quadrants, the x-axis is completeness of vision. Okay, so the the rightmost location is the company that has the best vision on local programming, and the left the leftmost side is the one that has the lowest vision. Which means, how do they think of local programming in the future, and how good they this uh, how well they can predict the future of local programming is the y axis is ability to execute, which is how how practical that the company can make the vision to become reality. Okay, so the higher the better. If we look at the quadrant, the the one on the top, and let's say I move this, the one on the top are the leaders. Okay, and you will see that Mendix is here. Mendix is one of the leaders in the global programming economy to gather. It is on the top right of the quadrant, so it is the best one. Okay. Followed by other players like our systems, Microsoft. Okay, Microsoft also has local programming platform. So if you, um, if you subscribe to, I think if you get Microsoft Office three six five, you might be able to play this Microsoft Power Apps. Yeah. So Microsoft Power Apps is one of the local programming platforms offered by Microsoft. It is the same idea. Uh, so you can pick any tools any platform that you like, and then you can try to learn about it. Ah, so come back to Mendix. We we choose Mendix. I choose Mendix for you because it is one of the best, okay? And it has a very good um, supporting ecosystem. Some of the companies are not very good in pro uh, local programming, such as Power. They have some system, but yeah, they are ranked among, among the last ones, okay? A bit of a history about Mendix. So Mendix started a long time ago in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, in 2005. And that's almost 20 years ago. And another important tips that I learned is that one of the co-founder of Mendix is Thai. So this person, Mr. Panayu Siri Gajangsi is Thai. And he is now in Thailand. He is an MD of the company called TBN Corporation. So Mr. Panayu was in Rotterdam at that time, and he was one of the main founder of Mendix. I met him at TBN because I yeah I, I attended the Mendix training. So um, it's a pretty cool that we have Thai people as one of the founder of this um platforms. Okay, but after that in two thousand eighteen. Mendix was being bought by Siemens, and now it is part of the Siemens company. Okay, so Siemens is a big uh, company that do various products, no? Like your Skytrain, the BTS is Siemens. And they also have other services like this Mendix uh, ecosystem as well. Ah, okay. So that is pretty much about my introduction to local programming. So we're gonna try to play around with the actual um, local programming platform now. Have you registered for Mendix account? If you already done so, you log in and then you should see a page that looks like this. Ah, so let, let's go to the Mendix portal. Not, not open the IDE just yet. If you already downloaded the IDE, don't, don't use it just for now. Go to the website first and open the Mendix portal. We're going to start creating the, the project from the Mendix portal, okay? You can launch the IDE, but don't use it for now because there are some problems when you when you start using uh, from the IDE right away. Yeah. So this is the Mendix portal, okay? It contains a lot of things, but most of the important things is it will contain all the, the projects that you have, okay? So this is my, these are my projects. And the Mendix portal acts as the server for your application. It contains version control. So the history of your development will be kept there. It contains the deployment of your application. So you can actually deploy to the cloud based on this uh, Mendix portal. And it keeps all your project as well. 
So we're gonna start by creating a new project first. Okay, so going to create app in the web. Okay, not in the IDE, in the web. Create app. Starting by giving the app's name, uh, I would call it Hello World. We're gonna do some basic Hello World application and followed by your name, okay? So that we have different uh, Hello World projects. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to share your projects to your friend as well. So let, let's create a Hello World followed by your name. And then you can decide the application icon by yourself. You can randomly ask it to randomly generate the icon for you, or you can specify exactly what icon that you want. Uh, I, I love to just random it. This one, ah, maybe this one, ah, okay. After that, you click next. And for now, we're gonna build a very simple uh, web application. So just select blank web app and then click create app. Okay, you should get something like this on your Mendix portal. Don't need to go to the IDE for now. Uh, let's do it in the uh, in the Mendix portal first. Okay, uh, select the icon and everything, and then we will see what are the what are the things that we can do in this Mendix portal. We can define the team. Okay. So when you do projects, you might have to share it with your friends. You are not doing the project alone, usually. So let's try to invite some members into your Hello World project. Click Invite Member, and then use the email address of your friends. It's best if you, they are in the same organization. So use the email address of KMUTT if you use it for your registration and then send an email to your friends and you can choose their roles in the project. Uh, if they are Scrum Master, they can do everything. If they are guests, they can just see the project. If they are product owner, they can do some limited amount of activities. Uh, so let's try to invite your friends. And after you have invited your friends, your friends will get the notification and when they accept to join, you can see that they appear in your project. So let's try to do this for one or two minutes. Okay. If you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand and I'll take care of it. Ah. If you send an email to your friends, so if you send a specific email, then they will appear here, okay? Okay, so let's try to do this for So this is where you share your projects to your friends, okay? So if you want to, to work in a team, this is a place that you invite your team members, okay? 
I will move to other um other parts. Okay, so you have documents that you can upload the project related documents. Think about this like a like a project management platform. Okay, and there are also some basic project management. Okay. Oh, okay. That's it. Oh, it's pretty slow now. I think we are all bombarding the, the server now. It's pretty slow. If you see the team server, you will see that this is actually a Git repo, right? So Mendix work as the version control for you as well. It keeps the, the version of your projects and it is based on Git version control, okay? Other things are the scrum board, okay? So you can have a scrum board by creating a story first. Have you guys learned about agile software development? Yeah, so story is one of the, the things that your software users can do, right? The story, like they can log in. So let's try to create a story. And I will try to create a simple story that a user can log into the system. Yeah. You can assign this story to anyone in your team. I have only me, so I assign to myself. I assign it to the next sprint. Um, I can add a task, like create the database of the users, and then Create the login page. Here's the login functionality. Ah, story type is feature. I don't have any tag. And I might put some story points. Story point is the is a is a number that you represent the effort that you have to use to finish this, right? So let's say five. Ah, create a story. So, you would have these um, sprint uh, story that you want to, that you, that you would have for your software development project. I show you just one story, but actually you can define multiple stories according to the, the user requirements, right? Yeah. But since this is not the, the main focus of this class, so I am going to skip this thing, okay? Ah, these are mostly the things that we can do in the Mendix portal. But next, let's do the thing that we are going to do. So we're going to develop the Hello World application by clicking Edit, Edit in Studio Pro, okay? So if you click this for... Microsoft Windows, it should open the Mendix Studio Pro IDE for you. But if you are using a Mac, it won't happen. Sorry about that. You need to open the Mendix by yourself and it will show in this welcome page. Okay, just a moment. I already opened it. Ah, you will see that when you open the Studio Pro, you will see your the project that you have created on Mendix portal. Now, which is this one in my in my case. So I select open in Studio Pro. Okay. It will do some of the synchronization between your IDE and the and the Mendix portal. And then you just click OK. What happens here is that 
the application from Mendix portal will be cloned to your machine. Okay, so it is similar to when you have a project in GitHub virtual control version control system and you clone the project in your local development. Okay, same thing. Um, it has some warning about my Git version, it's okay. And then you would see this page, okay? This is a main page of your application, I mean, of your IDE, okay? Let's do some quick go through of the parts in your IDE. The left is the explorer, okay? So this is where, where your things will be uh, stay, okay? There are three levels, application level, system level, and the module level, okay? Today we will mainly work on the, the module level. So expand the my first module, and then you will see that there are five items inside the my first module, which is domain model, settings, whole web, images, and my first logic, okay? Double click the home web item, and then you will see this very simple page called home. Okay, so this is the very basic page that contains only static information. So you would have the title called home, you have some text here, and then you have some placeholder here that, that allows you to put some other items in. So First, let's try to modify this header into something else. Uh, let's see, I called it um, Hello World, Chaeyong. You can play around with the render to be heading one, heading two, and so on. Ah. And then you will see the change uh, automatically and suddenly in the UI, okay? Ah. Does it work? Is everybody in the ID now? Okay. Okay. So, um, the bottom, the bottom part is the warnings and errors and information that that you need to look uh when you have some problems. So let's try to do some basic errors. Like if you want to. If you want to add some text box, there's a there's a panel on the on the right that contains a lot of widgets. Okay. So let's try to drag some widgets in. Let's say I'm gonna drag a text box into my page. You will see that when I drag a text box into my page, it will have this red dotted line. Because the text box in Mendix, it must be associated with some of the data uh, behind, okay? So you will see that in the error bar, uh, error panel here, it shows that this widget can only function inside a data computer, so on and so on, okay? So if you have any issues and it cannot be, it cannot compile, the project cannot compile, you need to make sure that you resolve all the errors here. Yep. We need to what? Uh, we need to finish on uh, develop fingers and then run. And then run, yeah. So um, usually the steps in, in Mendix is you have to do data modeling first, and then you work on the UI, and then you run the program. We, we're going to go through that step now. So this doesn't work. We remove the UI and see whether it resolved the issue. Okay. So after you have deleted the text box that you just added, the, the error is gone. Okay. So when you have any problems, come back to the error window to see what are the problems. On the right, you have a panel of widgets and building blocks. So the widgets are the UI element that you can use in your web application. It contains buttons, it contains menus, it contains authentication, it contains display, data container, charts, so on and so on, okay? So lots and lots of things. The other tab contains building blocks. So the building blocks are the combined 
widgets that works for some specific scenarios. So building blocks can be used when you know what you want. Like if you want some list, you can select the list building block. If you want some cards, you can select the cards building block, so on and so on, okay? And this is, um, this is the basic application that we already have. So let's try to execute it once to see what happens, okay? With this application that doesn't have any errors now, you click on the, the green arrow button, run, okay? Ah, let's try to run it. It will take some time for compilation and checking of everything. And after that, it will, it will tell you that the, the application is ready to be used. So click run. Okay, my app finishes running and then no, it finishes compiling and now it's running. So when I click view app, it's gonna open a web page for me. And if we look at the URL here, it's localhost 8080, right? So it is an application that's running on your local machine and it has a port 8080. This is the application that we just see in Mendix Studio. You can see that this is what, what we see is what we get, right? So you will see this thing and it actually deploy as the same thing that you have seen. Ah, so you can see that there is not much to work on. There is a menu that doesn't have anything. Um, this is the static text. And you can change the language, but there is no language to change. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna add some functionalities into the applications. Okay. I'm gonna ask you to develop an application that performs student registration. Okay, you have the students and you want to register for a course. How should it work? Ah, so go back to Mendix. Okay. Next, we're gonna move to modeling the data now. So in in every uh Mendix application, we would usually start by the domain model. Okay. Inside your my first module. There is an item called domain model. So domain model is the location that you store the structure of your data in a very similar way as the class diagram or the ER diagram. Okay. We call each one of the data that we have as entity. So let's start by adding one new entity. You can right click or you can use the mouse to click at the E uh, icon here. So you would get uh, I usually do right click. When you right click on the uh, workspace, you would get new entity. Right click and then select entity. You get the new entity. It is a blank entity. So we need to modify it first. So you double click the entity. Okay. The dialog box of the entity properties will open up. And now we can start changing it. So the first one, I would call this a student entity, okay? I want to keep, I want my application to keep information of the students, and let's say your information, and I call it a student entity. What should be the attribute, okay? You click new under the, the attribute menu here, click new, and what should be the first one? What should be the attribute of a student? Student ID, ah, student ID. So student ID, ah, I switch, ah, I switch to this microphone. Student ID. Student ID, um, in this case, you, you will see that the application suggests me 
the data type of auto number. But in this case, I want my own format of the student ID. So um, I want it to be integer instead, okay? That's the student ID, right? The second one, what should be the second one? Student name, right? Name, uh, name. And you select the data type as string, okay? ID, name, let's add address, okay? So the third one is the address. It is also a string. The last one, let's try some other data type, birth date. So when you select birth date, you change the data type into date and time. Okay. And then you click okay. Ah, and I think that is that is pretty much that we need for our basic application. We have an entity called student. It has student ID, it has name, it has address, and it has birth date. So you click okay. All right. So I should enable zooming so that you can see easier. Just a moment. So let's see. Ah, so this is the student entity. It has student ID, it has name, it has address, and it has birth date. Okay. In Mendix or in low code platforms, this step will be similar to having a database set up and then you start defining the database table already. Okay, so you start creating the first database table called student. All right. It is a blank table for now, but it has all the structure that it needs. Okay. Ah, next. We're gonna create a page that will manage the student information. So from the student entity that you have, you right click and then you select generate overview pages. Okay, right click and then select generate overview pages. Uh, just a moment, click at the entity, generate overview pages. You select the student object and then you click OK. You will see that we have this new folder generated. It's called Overview Pages. It contains two pages inside. The first one is Student Overview Page, which has the UI that follow our design of the entity, right? You will see that this overview page contains student ID, student name, address, birthday, and some basic operations like edit and delete. Okay. It also has yeah. Okay, this one. Okay. You you go to the domain model, you you right click at the entity that you want, and then you select generate overview pages. Yeah, and then you select. Yeah, then you get the page. Okay. Ah, so yeah, you can stop me anytime. Okay, just let me know if you cannot follow. And there is a new student button that automatically generated for you. It links to this page. So the second page is called student new edit, which is the, the form for you to in enter the student information. And it contains all the attributes that you define. It contains the student ID, it contains the name, contains the address, and it contains the birthday. Okay. Ah. For now, we have created the new pages, but there is no way to access this page. Okay. So if you run it, you would see. I try to run it again. Some step. Yeah, one of the bad thing is that it's pretty slow to run. Uh, 
save model, view application, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, if you go to your, oh, sorry. Oh, if you go to your application, why it doesn't work? Oh, it's still running, okay. Mm, okay. If you go to your application in the browser, you will see that it still looks the same. And there is no way to access those new pages that you just created. So we must do this in our uh, Mendix Studio Pro first to add access to your page. The first way that we can do is we add we add it to the navigation menu. So the navigation menu is this, this one. Okay, let's try to play around with the navigation menu. You go to the app level, and then you open navigation. Okay, app, go to the app level and open navigation. You would see that there is this list of the items in the navigation menu. There is the first one that goes to home. So we're going to add the new item called students. Okay. You can select the icon as well. So whatever you like, um, if you search for person, you will see some of the icons. So I would select this one. Okay. Person icon. And last one on click. When the menu navigation menu is clicked, we're going to show a page. And then it will ask you which page to show. So we go to my first module, and then I select a student overview page. And then I click OK. OK. After doing that, you would get the second item in the navigation menu. And we, let's try to see how it how it works. You rerun the application. Okay. If you cannot follow, go to the app and then select navigation. There's a there's a place to define the navigation item. You click new item and then you name it student. And then you select the icon, whatever the icon that you want. And then you select on click to show a page. And then you select the page, student overview. Okay. Ah, by doing this, when it runs, you would get this menu item with the second item here. And then you will see that it calls students. And when you click, you would get the student page. Okay. Pretty easy. And this is the real working application. So you can get started very quickly using this platform, right? Oh, 
Let's try and uh, let's say a bit. Okay, so can you do it? Uh, yeah. Okay. The second one is we can create the the button by ourselves to access the the new pages that we created. So come back to my first module and then you go to the home web. Okay. I'm going to add a button. So let's search for a button widget. And the button widget has many types. We're going to use we're going to use the one called we're going to use the one called open page button. So you drag the open page button into this location. I'll do it again. So it is that there's a predefined location in your home page with, with nothing, right? So we drag open page button into this column. And then we select student overview and then we click select. You're going to get a new button here with the word student overview. Okay, so let's configure the button a bit. I will call this students. I will select the menu icon to be person just like I did with the previous one. And then I select some button style. Okay, so you can play around with the button style. Like primary will be blue. Um, Info will be light blue. Success will be green. Okay, so yeah, can you can try whatever you like. So this is primary style and the word students. Okay, when you finish this, run again. What you see is that in your home page, there will be a new button called student. And when you click the button, it will also go to that student page. Okay. So this is 
another way of creating navigation in your application. Uh, so you can add it to the navigation menu, or you can create a new button to, to show a page. Okay. Ah, since we have this student page, let's try to add some information of the students. So if you click new student, you will see a pop-up showing um, information of the students that are needed. So I'll add, let's add a few students, like two or three. You know, student, um, I'll follow the format at Mahidon, 6388001. Uh, my name, Bangkok. Select the birth date. Uh, sometime. Okay. I add the second student. Um, uh, some name, some birth date. I added the third student. Let's try to have different, um, different provinces and different. Uh, name characters, okay? So we're gonna try searching for them as well. So uh, I change this into other day and then save. Okay. By having this, you can try to use the filter here. So let's say you want to search for Chaiyong, something start with C, you can type in the filter. You want to search for some address like Chiang Mai, then you can filter it to have only this student. Um, if you search for student ID, you can specify the specific user ID and then the, the filter will work for you. Okay. okay. Ah, is everything all good? That man. Okay. Next, we're going to add a few more entities into your application. So, in this student registration, the requirements is the student can register for multiple courses and one course can have multiple students register. So we go back to our domain model. So double click the domain model. Let's create two more entities. The first one is called course, course, and the course entity consists of the first one is course ID, which I select as a string. Okay, so course ID is a string. It contains something like CPE three three four. Now, so that is a code code. Uh, the course code, right? So I add the first one. The second one is a course name, uh, which is a string. The third one is the instructor for that course, also a string. Ah, okay. And then you would get the second entities in your domain model. Okay. Ah. And the last entity that I will create is uh, an entity called enrollment. Okay, so I add another entity. I called it enrollment. And in the enrollment entity, I would need only one thing, which is enrollment date. Okay. I want to know the date that a student enrolled in a course, and the rest will be getting from the relationship between the entities. So I add the enrollment date. I select the type as date and time, and then I click OK. Okay. Ah, now we have three entities, student, course, 
and enrollments, okay? Next is, we want to add some association between them. So I told you that the requirements is one student can register to many courses and one course can contain many student registration. So we're gonna add association by, you put the mouse next to the border of the enrollment entity, okay? You would get this white circle coming out and then you drag it to the student entity. Ah. You get this first association or relationships in the Yeah, we uh, one this this three adds one too many from student to enrollment. One student can have many enrollments and one enrollment needs to be only one single student, right? So that is one too many. Um we do the same thing from enrollment to course. And you will get this again, one too many relationship that one course can have multiple enrollments, but one enrollment needs to be for only one single course, okay? So by having these associations, you capture the requirements that one student can register to many courses, and one course can be registered by many students. It is a kind of actually many to many relationships, but we, we spread it out to be one to many on two sides. Uh, if you study the ER diagram, you would you would remember that if you have many too many, you would need another table, and then you have one too many on both sides. So this is the, that situation, okay? Ah, by by doing this, you already have the the database structure that contains students, course, and enrollments. Okay, we're gonna generate the pages for each one of them. So first, rename the one that you already generated to be student pages, uh, student pages, students pages. Okay, so that it contains itself uh, within the student pages. Next, we're gonna generate the page for the course. So you right click at the course entity and then you select generate overview pages. Only the course now, now select only the course and then you click OK. You would get the second folder. And this one, rename it to course pages. C-O-U-R-S-E. OK. Ah, let's look at the course page a bit. So the course pages contains course ID, name, instructor, and some basic uh, operations. It also has the new course button, which will open this page. Edit course, which has course ID, course name, and the instructor. Okay. So I'll give you two minutes to add this, uh, to add the course into the navigation menu and also add a button into the, the home page. Okay. Can you add the button, the second button to the home page to go to the courses page? And also add the navigation menu to to the course page as well. Ah, let's do that for two minutes, and I'll be walking around. Yeah. Uh, let's add the 
navigation menu and also the Okay. Ah. So for the navigation menu, I would open this navigation, okay, and then I add new item. I add the courses, which the icon, I don't know, I choose book. Ah. And then on click, I show a page and I go to my course overview, okay, and then I click OK. And then I would get the third icon in my navigation. And on my home page, where's my home page? My home page. It's my home page. Home. Ah. I will add a new button. Open a page button here. I will add to the course overview page. And then I will edit it to be courses. I select the icon to be book, open, and then the button style, I might select info for this one. Ah, okay. Ah, you can see that the button very close to each other. There is also a way to, to, to arrange things, right? So in this um, widget, you would have this thing. Ah, let's, let's see, I will pick something. You can have, where is it? Oh, it's in the building block. No, it's in the widget. Um, yeah, there's a layout grid. So if you want to organize things, you can put the layout grid. And then let's say I pick this thing. Then I can put the button into each one of the columns and then it will nicely format it, okay? Yeah. You don't need to do it. It it works even you don't put the layout grid. Okay. Ah, after you have this, I think I'm running out of time. I will finish around twelve fifteen. Okay. I hope so. Ah, so you can try to run it again. Then deploy. Compiling JavaScript actions, compiling the file, window application. Your app is starting. Ah, okay. So if you if you did everything correctly, you would get this third menu to show the courses. And if you go to the home page, you would get the button courses. When you click it, it goes to the course page. Once you are at the course page, let's try to add some courses. Uh, I add CPE three three four. Software engineering, instructor, uh, let's say myself. I add another course. What are the courses? Do you have CPE 101? Yes. Okay. What is the course name? Uh, it's the name is uh, engineering. Engineering what? Exploration. Exploration. Okay. Yeah. Who is the instructor? <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I think anybody is fine. Uh, just call Oh, okay. So, so you have the courses and um, you can, you're right. You add the courses, you have the students, okay. Does it work? You can try to delete the course. Now, if you can, if you click the delete, if you click the edit button, you can edit um you can edit the 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 records if you click delete it would delete the the item okay so i would try to create 102 um let's say programming bell 
and then you can delete them by clicking delete. Okay. Ah. Last one. Last one. I I give you another five minutes to add the pages for enrollment entity. Add the pages, add the navigation menu, add a button to the enrollment page. Okay, and let's try that five minutes. Since we are running out of time, I will do it quickly. So enrollment, you will create, generate overview pages. Select enrollment, you get the new pages in the Explorer and we rename it to enrollment pages. Okay. You get the enrollment overview, which contains only enrollment day because the enrollment entity has only enrollment date. If you open enrollment edit, new edit, you will see that from the association, it pulls student and course for you, right? So this thing is not in the entity itself, but it's in the association between the entities. So this uh, Mendic Studio, it knows the relationship. So it generates this uh, two drop down list for you, okay? Ah. I add the navigation to this, uh, the last one, I add enrollment. I select the icon, what should be a note. I open, I show up page. Enrollment pages, I open overview and select okay. Uh, so my navigation is done. I go back to my home page. I select open page button. I link it to the enrollment overview. 
I modify it a bit to call enrollments. Um, I select the icon node. Ah, and then that would be it. Okay. Ah, I have these three button. I run it. Okay. Okay. What we will see is that there will be additional navigation menu on the left. And ah, now I have this enrollment and if I go to the home page, there is also an enrollment button. So lastly, let's try to add some new enrollment. So I'm gonna enroll to uh so Chai Yong will enroll in CPE 34. And I add a few more. So there is another student, Andy, that enrolls to 101. And there is another last student, Bella, that enrolled to 34. Okay. The last thing is we will see that this enrollment page is a bit too few uh too few information. We don't know who enrolls and we don't know which course that he or she enrolls, right? So we go back to modify this page a bit. So if you go back to the enrollment overview page and then you go up to the data grid level and then you double click the data grid, there, there will be an option for you to add the new column. So let's add new column called, um, okay, so you click the attribute first. We link this to the relationships enrollment student. And I want to get the student name. So you select student name, and then I call the caption student name, and then I click okay. I got the second column, I move it up. I add another one. Attribute is student enrollment course relationship. I go to the course, I select the course ID. Um, ah, okay. And then I call this course ID, okay? I move it up. Okay. So my enrollment page now will contain enrollment date, student name, and the course ID. Ah, so if I rerun it again, now I think our application is complete, okay? So let's wait a bit. Okay, it runs. Ta-da, and you will see that now it has enrollment date, it has student name, it has course ID, and it has the, the option for you to edit and delete it. So yeah, I'm running out of time. So this is the very quick run through of using low code programming. So we can use a platform like Mendis to develop a simple applications that um, can be created in just, I think if you, if you are proficient, you can create this in like 10 minutes. I think I can do it in 10 or 15 minutes. So it saves you some time if you are working on some prototype that you want to get to the user quickly. And uh, let's say if you want to develop some, some basic applications for yourself, you can, you can also do it, okay? Ah, there, there is a lab exercise that you will do more detail and bigger version of the app. The exercise will contain multiple entities and then there will be some validation rules that you can add and also some micro flow that involves some kind of a bit of programming, but it's not like writing the program. It's like connecting blocks and drawing the flow chart and so on. So you do the lab exercise and then you submit Oh, I forgot. The last thing is, after we have created the application, you can click the publish button, but don't do it now. The publish button will deploy your app into Mendix Cloud. And when it finished publishing, you get the public URL that you can send to anyone and it can access your application. So when you do the lab exercise, when you finish, you click publish, and then you get that 
URL and then you submit it to the LEBT platform. Okay, that that is the evidence L two, LEB two. Okay, sorry. Um, and then that's the evidence that you have done the exercise. Okay. Ah, um, yes. Yeah, since it's already known, so I think that will be it for today. Any questions? Yep. Oh yeah. Um, you want it to be spread out like this, right? So, in you can you can turn on this X-ray mode, and you will see what are the elements. So this is actually inside what's called the layout grid. So if I move it out, I would get the button that stick to each other like this. Okay, I delete the layout grid first. Uh, nah, I delete the layout grid. Yeah, first it looks like this, right? I pull this thing called layout grid into this container. And there's a size that you can choose for the layout grid. I choose 3333. Three, three, three. And then I drag each button into each of the columns. Yeah, and then you would get something similar to what I have. Does it work? Yeah. Diamond. Uh, I, I will be around for some questions. So that's all for today. Uh, I hope it will be useful for you. You can use it for your first project as well. And yeah, see you next week. Thanks for coming. Uh, oh, no, next week. Next week is holiday. Week next after. Week. Uh, the week after next week. Uh, okay. <laughs> see you. Uh, uh, ครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับคร